alligators. <laughs> oh, we got another week on tap here. Starting off with a little Motley Crew. You know, I could do that from time to time here on Lollygagging Sports. I am joined, as always, by with <laughs> Samantha Button and Matthew Irby. Uh, Samantha, I, I got to ask you first off before anything: um, Have you found your gas mask yet? <laughs> I, yeah, I, we did. It's good we didn't throw out the masks. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, we should throw these away. We're never going to need these again. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> now the air is on fire. So all you Browns fans will appreciate the orange is orange. Um, the orange sky got orange today, but I actually think it's getting better um, this evening. It's it's moving south. So I, I thought oh, it, was headed for, it was headed for State College. So, um, Bo, I think it might be coming your way. I was about to so say, I'm too south. <laughs> I'm too south of you. That's yeah. <laughs> Don't be sending the orange smoke to me. Well, Although, I, I sincerely, we tried our best. You know, I don't know. Hopefully, it will dissipate by the time it gets all the way to Florida. But oh man, can't, okay. can't you okay. just? I mean, you, you have all those skyscrapers. Like, can't you just get up there and just blow to the west to send it to Irby? I mean, he, he's the emergency it's, services person for the, for the, for Collin County. I mean, come on, Irby, you, you would take the smoke, wouldn't you? Just, I, I would feel like you would turn it into some sort of a fun project. Uh, yes, that is. In, in emergency management, we do get nerdy over these things, and um, I have been enjoying it. Um, I know that, Smithy, you're not enjoying it, but um, I was peppering her all morning long. Um, our, our staff is, you know, we, we like to do is, is we kind of like to prepare. When something's happening to one person, we try to learn what, okay, how are you handling it and all that, so we can kind of prep. So I was peppering her all morning with, like, what's going on? How's it going? And all that fun stuff. So, no, not not as weird here. Um, thing, things are a lot calmer here. Uh, you know, we've got our integrity in place here, unlike the PGA. See, okay. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. We're not touching that, right? <laughs> Okay. Speaking of things that are on fire, <laughs> we're we're baseball football guys. Oh. I, I've never been happier than this week to just be baseball football. Um, no, you know, one more little little thing on the on the on the on the, on the orange smoke. The actor like writer in me really started to, to, to spin around some some movie ideas. You know, like tornadoes and orange smoke combining into this really just end of the world type film. What do you guys think? I would turn it into a comedy, but that's just me. Add some sharks. I mean, shark natives with, with orange smoke. With shark, orange shark. <laughs> wait, orange sharks in orange smoke. Yes. Um, I could get on board with that. I don't know. I'm like a classic like under reactor to stuff like this. Like I, I think it's from like growing up in the snow belt where we were all like driving our cars around in whiteouts when we were like 16 that I'm like super unimpressed by like weather events. I'm just like, "Uh uh-huh, we're not going to die. So, you know, but it is funny saying New Yorkers are tough about a lot of things, but they're not great at weather. Um, And like the, like colossal (laughs) meltdowns that people have over things like this, or like, I don't know, three inches of snow or whatever. Like, I mean, like my husband and I like grew up in the Rust Belt, like, you know, we, we're like, <laughs> okay, snow, tornado, whatever. It's fine. You're not going to die. But, like, you know, there, there's a bit of the sky is falling from the people who are not used to catastrophic weather. <laughs> so, See, and that's where I, I would like to then, let's do the sequel. Let's do the sequel to Don't Look Up. And you can do the uh, what's happening all there, but just, just don't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, don't look up. That was such a... It came out of nowhere, but it was actually a really good movie. <laughs> I never even heard of this. Like, I don't even know what this is. Did something fall out of the sky? Was it snakes? Did no, snakes it's, fall from it, the sky or cows or something? It's got to no, be. I'm conflating snakes on a plane and twister. It's, oh. it's <laughs> got to be. Honestly, cast. the best way to, yeah, I'll say the best way to put it for you, Samantha, is it's a movie about an asteroid coming to destroy the Earth. And Americans just, not all of them, but a handful of Americans just decide that, well, if we don't look up at it, then it won't hit us. Yeah. It was, it's so deep impact. <laughs> yes. In a way. The world's most depressing movie. Um, yes, in a, in a way. In a, in, 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 sort of. Uh, <laughs> this, one's, 
this one's pure comedy, and it's it's comedy gold, though. I'm with you. It's really good. Uh, it's it's really good. It's really good. Now, I, I in my opinion of movies is kind of skewed because again, Major League Three Back to the Miners is one of my favorite movies. I like to say that from time to time, just to remind people that I still believe that. Um, but still, yeah, like this one, this one, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Um, I recommend it. What was it? It's, what's it on? It's on Netflix, Irby. I think it's on Netflix. If I remember correctly. Yes, it's not or HBO, but yes, it's. Uh, uh, but yeah, back to the back to the orange smoke, the weather. This is this is fantastic. This is. <laughs> this is uh, gotta love it. Gotta love See, it. He's yeah. so excited. He had me sitting yeah. in pictures, like which I, I did voluntarily, by the way. It's like, oh, this is more fun than like standing around watching people around here with meltdowns. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll play emergency management with you today. <laughs> well, I. They, I mean, you've been on the phone with me, Samantha, before, where I'm in the middle of a tornado, warnings all around, and I'm standing on my roof going, I don't see it. <laughs> Why is everyone running? I don't see it yet. And then, then that fun moment when I see it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I should probably get inside. <laughs> yeah, see, this is why I think that, you know, like, those of us, the big, you know, like, rust belt, show belt people have a lot more in common with, like, you Texans in terms than we do with, like, North Easterners in terms of the way we react to these things. Like, I don't know, I'm just going to go outside and look at it for a while and see what happens. All right, okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Let me get carried off to us. All right. All right, you know, running the risk of getting completely off topic here, there is one little small story I can share with you. Um, I was working in Texas, and we had some New York bankers in town, and there was a hurricane in the Gulf, and I've never seen... A group of people get so freaked out by a hurricane that was never going to impact them whatsoever. Because like the, where we were at in Texas was at least 200 miles inland. So not exactly a problem. <laughs> but they were freaking out that a hurricane was coming in their general direction. Oh, you should have heard him when there was like a tornado out over the ocean that was nowhere near us and not coming anywhere near us. And we were just like... <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's great. Like, you know, those of us who are transplants from places that have tornadoes were like, mm -hmm, okay, whatever. You know, people are like, I don't know, my building doesn't have a basement. And you're like, okay. <laughs> I, you know what it sounds like, this, this panic for panic's sake? It sounds like Cardinals fans. Panic for panic's sake. Things aren't going well, let's just panic. I don't know. Late, lately, that tornado's hit that house. Um, I think. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I don't think it's a rational panic anymore. Oh boy. Okay. Well, speaking of baseball, that's why we're here. Let's let's talk some baseball <laughs> before we get to armchair umpire and go completely off the rails here. So, Samantha, you want to bring us back on on our on our rundown path here? Well, guess what? Good news. We were already there uh, because Irby nicely segued us with Cardinals panic. Right. Um, so so we're gonna we're gonna stick with the Cardinals to to kick off here and, and talk a little Nolan Gorman. Um, things got better, and, and then they got maybe not as good. So, you know, we were wondering, okay, is this the, the breakout? Um, you know, it certainly looked like his numbers were coming up from his first year, last year in the league. But uh, he's cooled off a lot over the last 14 days. I'd say about 176 with one home run, 33% strikeout rate. So that's not great, um, which is too bad because I think for a little while there, it was looking pretty promising. I mean, he has – pretty good numbers. He has, you know, already, he has 28 career home runs and 14 of them have come this year mm -hmm. um, so far. So, so that's pretty good. And his triple slash is up in every category, but he's coming back down to earth a little bit now. So I'm curious what you guys think. Is this just like, yeah, the Cardinals, when it rains, it pours. Is Where, where are we at on Nolan Gorman here? Are we worried about the fact that he's, regressing to the mean a little bit, or are we saying, hey, this is just a bad two weeks and anybody can have a bad two weeks? I mean, I always want to, I guess, defer to it's only been a couple of weeks. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> but going into week three, you know, I'm actually getting a chance to watch what you watch watch the Cardinals up close and I'm not seeing much of it much much improvement over the last two weeks. So Irby, what, what do you think here? This I know this is one of the guys you like to watch a lot, but if he's going to turn around, it's going to have to come quick. Yeah, it's you know it, it's kind of funny. This is going along with how the the the, the Cardinal season as a whole has been going, and, and like you said, it wasn't bad. Like like it, 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 April April was good, 
it was it, good. Like we can get away with good. Like it was good. It was a good start. It was fine. It really was fine. And May there was a sound of it. Yeah, this this little low right here is beginning to see. You know, he's seeing better pitching in the Royals. So I guess not all better pitching, but still, <laughs> I. You know, it's the, the old what we talk about with these guys. And I know this is second year, so I, I don't want to say second year slump or anything like that. Because, Matthew, you said it well. We're already starting to see him tick those marks um, of what he did last year. And he played in 89 games last year. So, you know, 30, still 30 games away from that mark this year. And he's already started to, to, to get career highs. So, it's good. And, and I guess the problem that I have, and, it, and it's not a, a problem with him, it's that it's it's a combination of the expectations. It's a kind. Of, it's where the team is as a whole. I mean, I I have to believe that if you're a major league player and you get to hit in between Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado, you should have good numbers. Like you should have pretty decent numbers just from that alone. So that's where I yeah I, I'm with you, Smith. That this is one of like okay, this is fine. This isn't, this isn't like dog sitting in a chair and the building's on fire. Fine. Like, this is actually just fine. This is just okay. And uh, that's the problem for St. Louis is that he was, the hope was, is that he was going to be a lot more. They were going to see a lot more from here. And, th and this was a, you know, with the addition of Contreras here, you potentially had these four great bats in there. And then you had, I mean, what we were starting to see from Jordan Walker. I, it's all things of, okay, this is the building of something that is solid. Maybe this is just a bad start. This is a bad year, whatever it is. But the pieces are there, and it's the same with Nolan Gordon. The pieces are there for him to be a solid player, and maybe that's what we need to do is, is we just all need to just, you know, he's going to be a solid player. He's not going to be a stud. He's not going to be a superstar, but he's going to be a solid player. And with the bats that are around him with St. Louis, that's not a bad thing. No, <clears throat> no, it's not a bad thing, but I mean, just, <laughs> I don't know, Smith, the, the, the Cardinals fans, they seem to be panicking about everything this year, so this is like ripe for the picking for them. Yeah, I, I think some of it is just sort of a, you have those seasons where like, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, and everything yeah. else that's mm -hmm. not going that wrong seems worse. So, you know, he had that, like, really embarrassing defensive gaff a couple of days ago. And, and I have to tell you, like, defense is not great, and that does bug me. I do not like second base and they cannot field their position. So that bothers me. Like, he needs to work on that mm -hmm. for sure. But, like, you know, Irby, you mentioned Goldsmith and Arenado kind of protecting the lineup. But, like, Arenado has not been great, right? But, like, I think we all believe that Nolan Arenado is going to, like, return to being some semblance of Nolan Arenado. And when that happens, that will help him too because he'll have the lineup protection that maybe he's not getting right now because, you know, he's the guy who's supposed to be, you know, part of protecting him is, is also having a very rough time. So, yeah, I just, I, I think this is a, yeah, everybody panic, everybody panic about everything when nothing's going right, but I, I don't know. I, I think he's going to be all right, but he must learn to field his position. That is bothering me. It bugs me. I do not like the, you know, below replacement level defense. <laughs> All right. What else do you got for us tonight, Samantha? So I thought we should talk about it. A gentleman who's um, been pretty well traveled uh, within <laughs> the framework of this baseball season. The guy is, it's the Gary Sanchez World Tour. And he's been <laughs> with both the Mets and the Mets of the West, or the Padres and the Padres of the East, if you like. Um, you know, in a technical sense, I suppose you could also say there is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Gary's, Gary's getting around, and I, I feel like it's it's sort of interesting and sort of hilarious, and, you know, he's, he's not doing well, exactly, but weirdly, he's doing better than, like, you know, career of Gary Sanchez is like a 226 hitter, right? Where he's getting 267 so far in the grand total of 11 games that he has played so far this season. Four two different teams, neither of which he was on at the beginning of the year and probably neither of which he will be on at the end of the year. So curious as to your thoughts on Gary Sanchez and, and Irby also as a um, as a catcher um, who has played this game at a, a relatively high level. 
I, I would like to know from a, a broader perspective, do you feel personally victimized by the number of catchers who have been repeatedly DFA this season? It ain't just Gary, man. It is going around. So I just, you know, how do you feel about that? Is it as a fellow catcher? Does this, you know, elicit empathy from you? Or do you just think, like, look at these losers. Of course they're losing their jobs. Like, you know, how do you look at how do you, look at I, you know what? I'm going to defer to Irby. I can't wait to hear this. I'm, I'm just, just going <laughs> to sit back. I, well, I, is Gary Sanchez a catcher? Are we still calling him a catcher? <laughs> He's a cracking. <laughs> catcher, small C, is that where we're going to small C catcher? Um, small C catcher yes. or catcher with a K? Yeah. Yeah. There we go, catcher, catcher with, with a K. K. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not surprised about the number. We see this when the teams are starting to bring this keeping three catchers and you, you want to have the, oh, we've got the one catcher that only works with this starting pitcher gets this catcher and all that and um, yes, I. But but on a personal level, yeah, I, I victimized. You know, we we all have one heartbeat. Um, catchers have one heartbeat. You may take a bunch of balls to the head, uh, but we all have one heartbeat. That's so. why you have one heartbeat. Right there. Yeah, exactly. Because we keep getting drilled in the head. It's um, yeah. This this tour has been. Uh, I, I, you know what? Enjoy the ride while you can. This is like watching the roller coaster that you know that we all know is not completed. Um, but we're watching the beginning part of it. It's like, ooh, this is fun. Like, you know that the thing's not completed. This is about to end in horror and tragedy, right? Like, this is, I, he, he hasn't hit anything up the middle, let alone the right field. Everything is to left. Yeah, sure, there's four home runs. That's great. Awesome. I, this is going to end terribly. I mean, mm-hmm. or maybe not. Actually, the, the horribleness of Gary Sanchez, catch it with a K, and the Mets of the West, like, is this the opposite, two opposites, two, two negatives make a positive? Like, is that how he figures it out? I don't know. I This is, enjoy it while it lasts, Padre fans. <laughs> this is going to be bad. Oh, God. You know, you know, I think my favorite thing here, Samantha, you go to baseball reference to pull up his stats, and they still have him in the Twins cap from last year. Like it's it's almost like you have to, he has to have a minimum set of at bats with one of these teams this year before they put the new cap on him. So no one's committed enough. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, you know, I really I'm, I'm into your theory, Irby, that maybe they cancel each other out. The Mets of the West and Gary Sanchez. Like, does that just come together and I don't know, repel or cancel itself out or? This is, a, this is an interesting theory I'm going to think a lot about. Like, what if Gary Sanchez becomes, like, playable? Like, can be, like, a replacement-level player for the Mets of the West after being with the Mets of the Mets? Like, I mean, so if you anything... I'm call him Sanchez because of Mark Sanchez. Like, I keep having to remind myself that that's a different person. Um, no, the, the only thing that scares me about Gary is that if this continues, then we know where we can get him back to all-star caliber. It's because you Yankees, the Twins, the Mets, the Padres, all that's left is him being an angel, right? Like, that's our progression of how this goes. The I am going to vote for him on my all-star ballot as a writer <laughs> just because you said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> what, what else do you have here, uh... And here's Samantha before we get into Irby's topics. All right, so last thing. Um, I, you know, we, I think we all have some opinions on, you know, super fans and, and some of these people who it's, it's interesting because these guys who show up at the ballpark regularly and kind of make themselves characters in the story, um, generally it, it will go bad eventually. You know, we all remember everybody's feelings about Marlins, man, right? So I've been thinking a lot about these kinds of guys lately, and specifically in this, you know, Zach Campbell, the, the home run troll, and others like him. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, it's, I wasn't necessarily paying a lot of attention to it until all of the, the brouhaha in, in Baltimore with the, the thing with Cedric Mullins and that kid, and it's, I have mixed feelings about, like, I don't think as an adult you're obligated to give anything you catch to, like, a kid you don't know. Um, I mean, I think that you should not tackle small children. 
mm-hmm. like, to try to get to a baseball. But if you catch it, like, and, and this mob of children that you don't know come up and, you know, surround you and, like, I don't think you're obligated to give that away, you know? Like, maybe maybe you've been going to games for 40 years and you've never caught a ball and you care way more about baseball than that kid. Like, I, I don't think that as an adult, like, I, I don't agree with, like, shaming people for not giving the ball away to, like, children that they don't know. But I do have some issues with a guy who is going around and basically strategically plotting the best place to sit to catch home runs because the only point of this, this is you're not there to enjoy the baseball game. You're mm-hmm. there to be the guy who catches the home run ball. So that's that seems a little gross. It's like, you know, it comes again into the super fan category where, like, somebody is doing something that is completely understandable, turns into a thing that I think is maybe not for me. And I just don't love the idea of it, it feels very mercenary to me. Um, and I know he does give away most of the balls to kids, but, like, there's a lot of attention that comes his way because of that and a lot of fuss made about it, mostly from him. So, and then he has the opportunity to kind of do the right thing in a situation where it probably was the appropriate time to, like, give the ball to a kid that you don't know. Um, Also, like, you've got plenty of them, you know. Like, you're not, like, random adult who's never caught a home run before. You're you're a guy who strategically puts yourself in the park so that you can get a ton of these. And then all of a sudden when the cameras are on you and you decide that's the day, you're going to be the guy who's like, why am I not giving this to a kid? I... I just, I don't know about this. I, I feel like it violates the spirit of sort of like, it's so cool to catch a home run ball. Like, well, not if you're turning it into like a blood sport. Like, I just, really, really, are you really enjoying baseball if you're doing this? Touring around and trying to, to snag home runs and taking them away from the people who are there because they love that baseball team and they're just dying to catch a ball hit by their favorite player. Like, ugh, gross. Well, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. It, it is gross. And, you know, like, I've been to hundreds of baseball games in my life. I've, I've had a, a home run ball come close to me one time. I was five. Okay? I'm 41. That's how it's supposed to be. Like, like you're not supposed to plot it out and, and be all strategic with how you're going to get a ball. Uh, first of all, I, I also have I take a little issue with hearing so much about it that you do that as an adult. Right, like I haven't been uber excited. Ooh, I'm gonna catch a home run ball since I was five. Right, that's that's something. That's why, like you know, that's why I if if I was to ever catch one, I'd give it to a kid because kids kids care about that I more would. than I do. <laughs> no, I, and you know what? That's that's the thing. And I also think that is also important because I think you hit something hit on something that needs to be said. Is like you're not obligated to give that ball to anybody. You catch it, that's your ball. Okay. Well, unless I'm going to get a couple million dollars for it, I'm going to toss it to a kid. And that's just my prerogative. That is my choice. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and tell the person next to me, oh, you got to give that ball to the kid. You're, you're over a certain age. What's the age? Where are we going to set the age? Is it 14, 15? Is that what we're going to say? If you want to really start to do this, like, oh, you got to be, if you're, if you're over 15, you have to give the ball to someone younger. No, that's not how this works. That's my choice. You have your choice, Samantha. That's just how we as fans operate. And we're in, both of us are within our rights to do so. But. Well, yeah, I, th- I think that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But to sit here and to try to plot using some sort of algorithm that you've come up with in your head as to this is where I'm going to sit. So I can catch a home run ball because I only care about if you if, if that's all you care about go to the go to the gift shop go 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 to the go to the where, whatever they, whatever whatever weird name they give your the name of your store in the merch store in the stadium I promise you they got a barrel of game used baseballs you could buy for five dollars if that's what you care about okay but if you're doing this then you're going to be a problem during the game because you're going to be lunging for things you have no business lunging for and getting into my nachos. That ain't happening. Not on my watch. I'm watching baseball here. I don't care that you bought a ticket because you think you can get a home run. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's where I take issue with it, is that you're there to catch a home run, not to see the baseball game. Like, if you are there to see a baseball game and because you care about the baseball game, then you can do whatever you want with that ball. I mean, I like I said, like, please don't run over small children trying to get a ball if you're an adult. Please don't do that. Like, yeah. that's not cool. But, like, if it comes to you and you catch it, you keep it, 
you can give it away, you can give it to your own kid. Like, I think any of those things are fine. I also think that if it's a meaningful home run for the player, you should give it back. I mean, yes, by all means, ask for something in exchange. Absolutely. Oh, but, sure. like, yeah. if you catch somebody's home run that's meaningful, unless, like you said, if you're going to make a million dollars off of it, then, like, sorry, dude, it's going to auction. You know, but, like, yeah. I, you, you know, you give the ball back. Like, but, like, I, it's just really, like, at what point you're not there then to enjoy a baseball game and maybe get super lucky. It's like you, Bo. Like, I never caught a home run ball. I've caught a batting practice home run. I have never caught a game home run, and mm-hmm. I have been through a lot of <laughs> baseball games. And I never got one, which is why if I did, I'd keep it. Or I might get it to one of my kids. That's fair. Mm-hmm. But, sure. like, I'm not giving it away to some strange kid. Like, no, absolutely not. But I'm also not going to run over a small child to get to it. And I'm certainly not going to plot where I sit going around to various ballparks so that I can, like, turn it into my own weird little enterprise. Because you're not there to see baseball anymore, dude. Like, no. sorry, Zach Hamill. You're not a guy. He's not a baseball man. No. Right? Absolutely not. He's a merch dude. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's all you are. Like I said, go, mm-hmm. go, go hit the tub. Filled with game used baseballs are like five dollars. Yes, they, at least yes. They, at least they used to be. <laughs> I don't know what they are now. It's been a while since I wanted one. <laughs> Irby, how about you? <laughs> Where are you landing on this? I well, one reiterating, yes, uh, good rule of thumb that Samantha's laid out here: don't run over small children. Just, just good rule of thumb. <laughs> this should probably apply to all things. Right? Just yeah. Not, it's just so, about things. Like, oh, yeah. This is in general. Don't run over small children. Football, yeah, basketball. Things. Yeah. This hockey. This is not a pirate's guideline. No. This is an actual yeah, rule. Yeah. This is <laughs> an actual rule is written somewhere. <laughs> so just for that. Yeah. No. Um. I. I'm with you guys. I, I don't love it. Um. We had it at the uh, the Rangers ballpark. I was about to say the old ballpark, but that was just only a few years ago. Um. At the Rangers last ballpark. Um, there was a, a, a young man who felt the need to do this stuff, and he I, sat out there all the time, and he was always sliding into kids and knocking people over and then dancing like an idiot, and it's mm-hmm. just it's disgusting and whatever. Man, it's not about you. and um, Giving the ball away, 100% with you guys, like you, you, personal choice and all that. I, I've done all different ones, so I've never caught a major league home run. I've got four minor league home runs, um, which has been... Great, and I've done something different with all of them. I had one that I barehanded in the air, um, so I did take the bow and then handed it to my son. <laughs> I had another one with him sitting in my lap, and the ball landed right next to us, and he was about uh, a year and a half, and it scared the life out of him. <laughs> it's just because all of a sudden, a ball has suddenly landed next to us. It's like, oh, we're good, buddy. But my favorite one was, I actually went to a minor league game, and it was one of those, like, this happens in the minors like those Tuesday 11 a.m. games that you're just because you got to get everybody on the bus for the next series and out there in the outfield and there's like nobody there. There's there's 500 kids sitting in like the third base section um, for a school or daycare that brought them all out there. And I'm just standing out in the outfield by myself having fun. Ball hit, watch it, and it lands next to me. And I go over and I pick it up and I can see what looks like thousands of children storming from third base towards the outfield. So I just did as, as I would, and I just kind of held the ball out in my left hand, just like, all right, here it is. First one here, it's yours. And that was that was a blast of just, like, watching these kids running and uh, almost running me over to get this one ball. <laughs> he started child hunger games right yeah, there. he did. Like, here's a baseball. <laughs> it's true. It's true. The, the funny thing about it... It was, it was like it was like fourth fifth grade is what was out there. So there was a the the person that got to be first was a girl, and it's because she hit her growth spurt yet first. So she's doing these long strides, and I'm watching these boys try hard, and they want to be like guys. Y'all got like like go ahead and give up. Like she's she's forty fifty feet ahead of everybody. Like y'all can stop running. <laughs> Hunger Games Junior. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. Is there anything you want to add here before we get over to Irby? No, no, I mean, well, you know what? Okay, I'll, t- I'll tell my story of the one I caught because it was an ill-advised move on my part. I had put a pair of scissors all the way through my hand uh, right before going to a Ben Indians game at Jacobs Field. 
because I was trying to make one of those red circle with the slash things to put over an old Yankee shirt that my dad had so it could look like no Yankees. You know, and Mm -hmm. I put a pair of scissors all the way through my hands. And I had to go to the hospital and get stitches. But because I'm me, of course, we went to the game anyway. Of course. And then like a dummy, I was standing out in the the outfield in in right center field during batting practice. And like, I don't know, I never caught anything at any major league game before. And a ball came my way and I stuck my hand up. You know, the one that had the stitches in it. Oh, Um, fun. And, yeah, that, that hurt. Um, I, I did get the ball. I managed to hold on to the ball, but I had to have my hand re-sewn at Jacob's Field. So, <laughs> you know, I, I do have that, which is, you know, an interesting uh, baseball memory to have. Can't say that I wouldn't trade it for, like, not having put a pair of scissors through my hand. But, uh, you know, it, it does hurt to catch those. And it hurts especially when you have a freshly stitched hand from about mm, 45 minutes before it happened. So oh, don't man. recommend that. Don't don't do this. Don't try this at home. Uh, Ouch. <laughs> my hand hurts just thinking about this. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Irby, you're up, buddy. What's up? Well, I'm gonna, you know, we as I've kind of been doing on here, I love tagging and talking about all these young, talented players that we're going to see soon. We're starting to see a lot a lot more this year of players we're starting to see and um this kind of falls in line of, hey, if you want to catch a home run ball, this one's going to hurt. Um, <laughs> Ellie De La Cruz got to make his Major League debut. Um, love when the Reds fall along with what we're trying to do here and produce. Um, also love that Mr. De La Cruz, although I love, I, I, the nickname popping out, Holy De La Cruz, running with that. So uh-huh. Holy De La Cruz got his first home run as well this evening. Um, I'd say unfortunately, so. He, yeah, it was just a little minor 458-foot shot that had 114.8 mile-per-hour exit velocity. So he kind of got a hold of it. Um, <laughs> he got a piece of it. <laughs> he got a piece of it. Probably didn't hit it on the, the square of the bat. But, I look, this is the prospect. Like, there's, I, We could sit here with numbers and go over numbers. Uh, if, if you've been living under a rock, you still have heard about his numbers. Everybody knows what this kid's been doing. Okay, we, we, we've seen the, the potential. You see the size. You see what he's grown into. Uh, if you've been paying attention, like uh, hopefully a lot of Reds fans have as well, you knew through the minor leagues that, okay, there's something here. Uh, I think he's here quicker than a lot of us thought. Uh, he had a fantastic year at, at high A ball last year, in which he earned his way to double A the second half near the end of the season, started out at triple A, and, and quickly made that case of like, no, he needs to be up here. Uh, and, and with Cincinnati, the way the season's going, there's no reason not to bring him up. So here we go. You brought him up. He's been a dragon, a lookout, a bat. Now he's a red. So what happens next? Okay, fine. Let's let's all be the, the, the romantic about this. All right? This is fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Just, just the little bit snippets that we've seen from, from Mr. De La Cruz. This is fun to watch. This is good for baseball. This, you know, this has even kind of like an O'Neill Cruz with the Pirates type of thing. So yep. the Reds and the Pirates can figure this out because that would be a nice little boom, boom, head to head. But everybody tap the brakes a little, okay? He's going to run into some problems. He's going to have some issues. You know, the, the, the young man's game is not complete yet, mm-hmm. okay? He's hit the majors. Now, believe me, I would love to be wrong here and just have him tear the cover off the base, right run off the bat, but it's not going to happen. Okay. This is great. This is an awesome start. I mean, you look at what his first game, two for four, got a double, drove in a couple runs, now he's got a home run, you know, all these things. Like, yeah, that's great. Okay, we've seen this before. I mean, Bo, you're a you, Ranger fan. Joey Gallo's first week was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Things came crashing down. Okay. This is great. This is good for baseball. Enjoy it. Reds fans, enjoy it. Baseball fans, enjoy it. When he hits the hits the hits the wall, when it happens, when the book's on, when somebody gives him a rough start, when he has like we talked about Nolan Gorman, you know, a, a bad two weeks, he's not a bust. Okay, I'm going to say that again. He's not a bust. Okay, as young as this man is, the talent that he is, 21 years old. Okay, he is he is blown up on the scene because his body is growing. Literally, like, like he, this is this is great. He has the great body type to be have a long, successful major league career. Okay, 
The bumps are coming. It's going to be rough. He has the body. He has the mindset to be a successful player. So let's hope for that. But also, when it doesn't go well here soon, it's okay. It's okay. You want him to hit the wall and break through it because that's when you get really good. So I'm excited about this. I know you guys are excited about this. I just love setting the expectations of, like, look, the bumps are coming. But in between the bumps, this is a special kid. Like, like I, 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 and, and, and I, this whole time I've been saying this, I've been trying to do analysts and analysts and analysts, but the fanboy wants to come out and just looking at how he plays the game, the speed he has, like I said, that six foot five, two hundred pound frame, uh, switch hitter. Yeah, this kid's something special. So I'm just gonna start off with a quick PSA for, for those of you baseball fans out there. The phrase that ball had a family has been overused, so stop it. Because I'm expecting Samantha, this kid to hit a lot more home runs like he hit today. And the first thing I see is that ball had a family. Stop it. We we you you've you've all ruined it. It is now no longer funny, so stop it. But no, this kid, I agree with Irby. This kid's special. Uh, he's off, obviously off to a fantastic start in his very young, what, two-game major league career, so let's not get too crazy, but I do think he is special. Yeah, it's been a great debut. I love when this happens. It's definitely Irby. I think you nailed it. This is that, you know, how can you not be romantic about baseball kind of debut. Like, so many of these kids, they come up – and they're, like, way overexcited, and they don't do well in their first couple of games. And it doesn't mean anything. Just, like, this doesn't really mean anything. But it's just great to see where somebody comes out there, and this kid, he can clearly handle the spotlight. He walks the way that he conducts himself. He looks like he's having fun out there, but he also looks like he's focused. So it, I love that. It's just, like, you know, you mentioned sort of what he looks like. I mean, this kid, he just looks like a baseball player. Man, like, he just has that look about him. So, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, he's not going to hit a home run every day. We all know this. There's going to be some ups and downs. But I, I just love when somebody comes up and has, like, a really, really electric debut like this. It's like a taste of what's to come. And it's, it's just so much fun. And I can't believe that the Reds, like, have allowed us to have this. <laughs> like, I just, like, I, when they called him up, I was like, really? I mean, it's, like, not like it didn't make sense. Of course it made sense. But you're like, Really? They're not going to, like, hold them down because of service time and then tell their fans again that they didn't pay for enough tickets so they're not allowed to have it like the other crews? Like, I, I was shocked. So, like, Reds, look at you. Look at you doing the right thing. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, what, what's next? Are the Orioles going to develop a starting pitcher? I don't it's know. It's not too crazy. <laughs> 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 All right. Irby, what's next on your list? <laughs> See, that scares me that you put that out there. Of like, now, now the Reds ownership is going to be like, okay, buy tickets or we will trade him. Oh, God, hold him hostage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to keep seeing this? We will do it. We will trade him. <laughs> um, so let's hope that doesn't happen. But, yeah, all right. So uh, next bit is, um, golly, you know, I, I, we talk about Memorial Day. We're into June and stuff. You know, we're, we're at that point of teams are real. These are who, you know, they – Teams aren't going away. They're doing well. Teams that aren't doing well aren't going to suddenly turn around. Um, the Miami Marlins are two and a half games behind the Atlanta Braves. What? <laughs> <laughs> Who saw that one? I mean, this is this is fantastic. This is a a division where we all knew what Atlanta was going to do. Um, there was way too much clickbait stuff about what the Mets were going to do, and that's not happening. The Phillies were supposed to get healthy, and, and, and as they got healthy, they were supposed to be getting better. That's not happening. But the fish are happening, and, and these fish are good. Um, you know, I, I, and, and they're doing it without Jazz. That's what's crazy for me, too, is it's seven games above five hundred, and they're doing it without Jazz. Um, they are doing it with a lineup of <laughs> – they've got plenty of other J's, which I love too. But um, we all know about Mr. 401. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, 401 now. Mr. Luis, I, I think I'm just going to – instead of calling him by his last name, we're just going to go, he's Luis 401 until something happens otherwise. Um, you've got the the veteran, though. You know, we, we are not fans of Mr. Guriel, the early Guriel. You've got the veteran nature of who he is and what he has been through. 
as a part of this. Uh, Segura has been around as well. Uh, Jorge Soler has been around. Like, like there is some legit veteran leadership here. And <laughs> the craziest thing, and this is where I, I, and I want you guys to run with this too, and one of the topics you had about these guys, but what I love the most about this, and this goes back to, once again, the beauty of baseball. <laughs> if you'd have told me at the beginning of the year that Sandy Alcantara is 2-5 and five with a 507 ERA, yet the Marlins will be seven games above 500, I think I would have died laughing. <laughs> you know, you know what's, okay, Smith, you know what's interesting about this for me? You know, we, we talked about this when Kim Ang was, was hired. For us, it was very much like a, it wasn't a matter of if, but when she turned this franchise around. I still didn't expect it this quickly. And I'm, I'm, I can't quite put my finger on exactly what's going on. Uh, they've pissed pretty well recently going into this season. Now they've got some bats. You know, I'm not going to say pop because a rise is all singles. Right? But it, it's, it's hard to just pinpoint exactly how they're doing this, which makes me obviously a little nervous about them in terms of their staying power because I don't know how they're doing it. If I knew how they were doing it and it was legit, that's one thing. But I still don't know. I don't quite know how they're doing it. They're just being really sneaky fish right now. Sneaky fish. <laughs> so it makes me think of that. Like, you guys remember that news article where the octopus would, there were some of the octopus that would punch fish just for fun. And he just did it for fun. Yeah. Like, that's what it makes me think of. Uh, I had a hero, by the way. Um, oh, octopus are so cool. Um, but so are sneaky fish. Um, yeah, I mean, the weirdest part about this to me is the fact that they are doing this well and it doesn't really have anything to do with Sandy Alcantara. That is the weirdest part of this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think there's a little bit of a, like, a pump the brakes aspect to this. Like, first of all, I, I hate to say this because, I mean, I love Luis Arise and I love him even more now that he's been traded out of our division the Twins are morons. Once again, the Twins are morons. But, um, he's not going to hit 400. Sorry, everybody. Ain't going to happen. Um, and I also think that that the Marlins are going to come back down to earth a little bit. But you brought up something interesting, Bo, which is, you know, we talked about Kim Ang and we said, yeah, she's going to turn this around. And, you know, the plan, that the word on the street that's been out there about the Marlins is that what they're trying to do is copy the Guardians model and the Rays model, which mm -hmm. is sort of how to develop from within on a budget, which mostly involves good pitching and contact hitting and the ability to move runners rather than... Um, going for sort of the big ticket uh, baseball, as it were. Um, but what's weird about this is, like, that's not a strategy that you can just, like, adopt, and then a year later it works. It takes time, right? So there's got to be more to this. Like, that's a piece of it, sure, and they're moving in that direction. We've certainly seen it with the pitching, and we've seen it with bringing in a guy like Luis Arise. Absolutely, yes. They are clearly going in that direction. But you can't just say that, and then a year later have that. It's a slower process than that. So what else are they doing, right? I mean, some of this has got to be just, I guess, opportunistic sort of when you're one of these middling teams, and sometimes things just break your way, right? Like you're, it's, there's some luck involved in this, for sure. But I don't know. I think it's cool. I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously, historically, don't love the Marlins for very obvious reasons, but <laughs> yeah. you don't really associate, like, the Kenny Marlins with the, like, Fire sale, 1997, ruined my life, Marlins. They're, they're just, you know, different fish, different fish, if you will. Sneakier fish, but more likable fish. I don't know. I've lost the fish analogy now. I don't know. Sneaky uh, fish. Yeah, Sneaky and, fish. And, and luckily, I don't think this. I don't think this front office is going to turn them into fish sticks after the season's over. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> All right, Irby, what else you got? I'm out of puns, man. <laughs> You're never out of them. You'll get more. That's You'll get more. That's, that's Don't fair. worry. That's fair. Um, so last one, uh, talking about all these 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 studly players that we're doing today. I mean, we, this is nice. We're kind of the you know teams players in a rut but lately, but not today. We're we're doing the awesome ones. So it's got me thinking about. You know, we're in the middle of all star voting. Um, it's something that I, I think we've all enjoyed. I will never forget the the love that I have as a kid when going and. 
using a pen or something to try and pop holes and having hanging chads and in my all-star validating where you're trying to say the names and then you find out some player who'd been called up like, his name's not on here. Why is his name not on here? Write it in. I don't want to write it in. Like, come on, this is ridiculous. So, um, lots of wonderful things, but it got me thinking about all-star voting, which I've, I've done a few rounds of. And I'll give you mine, but then I want to hear y'all's as well. Is how do you vote? Like, are you a straight ticket guy? Ooh. Are you a, are you a fan of, you know, a sprinkle in here or there? Are you straight numbers? Is it an OPS thing? Is it a, is it a history thing? Is it a, is it a cool name thing? I mean, this isn't quite like, you know, March Madness where we look at pretty colors and wonderful nicknames, but me personally, so I'm, and, and it's different. So NL, I like to sort, and I love now that if you, if you use the app, you can sort these things. I sort by OPS, and then I go from there. And, 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 and from there, then it's a backwards of, you know, on-base percentages and, and home runs and RBI and team performance and stuff like that. Um, and it also comes down to, 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 you know, many times it's down to two, three players, and then at that point it's very much a gut thing. It's a feeling of what name am I reading more of? What do I feel like I'm seeing more of? And that's where the history comes in. Uh, on the AL side, I, I'm i not a straight Ranger. I'm not a straight ticket Ranger fan. Um, I have in every single one put Jonah Heim and Marcus Simeon, and we'll continue to do that, and no one's going to talk me out of it, and I don't care. And so I will continue that. But And Amadella Garcia as well. I have all three of those. Just boom, 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 boom. Um, but other than that, I will sprinkle in um, it's kind of the same thing, the OPS and then backwards of the names I hear from 13 of the other 15 teams, or 14 teams. And I'm sorry, Mr. Yarnder Alvarez, but you are not getting my vote until you change teams. So other than that, what do you guys do? How, how do you approach All-Star? Well, uh, okay. Um I will say this: I am not straight ticket either. Uh, when it comes to voting the American League, if a Ranger is, is worthy of it, I'll absolutely do that. And I also have put Simeon and uh, Heim uh, on my All Star ballot. Notice I did that singular because I'm also a baseball purist. One fan, one vote. I only submit one ballot. I've, I've always only submitted one ballot. I never do the whole. I could do twenty and one. No, one ballot. That's just how I operate, how I roll. Um, but I will say this. I'm very competitive, and this is me being spiteful. Um, I basically vote for really awesome American League players and really shitty National League players because I want the American League to win. So maybe that takes the baseball purist out of it a little bit. I don't care. I'm competitive. Uh, but that's, that's, my, that's how I roll. Uh, Samantha, how about you? What goes into your vote? So... Mine does change a little bit from year to year. Um, right now, we are in a phase where I am absolutely, totally, and completely in love with the current Guardians team. So right now, I'm voting straight ticket Guardians in the American League. Um, and there are points in the past where I have voted straight ticket Guardians. There are also times in the past where I might have voted, let's say, Guardians heavy, but I veered off course um, for a couple of players when perhaps I was not so enamored with the team as a whole. But right now, we're in a total Homer street ticket. I don't care. I'm sending all my guys. I'm sending my crappiest guy. I even voted for my catcher. You guys know I hate our catchers. I hate them. Wow. I for him anyway. <laughs> Mike Sonino. I gave him my vote because Guardians all the way. So right now, and for the foreseeable future, I will probably be a straight ticket Guardians voter in the American League. Um, and then, oh, and I, before I move on to the National League, I just want to say that, like, I want to echo the sentiment that, like, this was way more fun when you had to punch out the paper ballot at the ballpark, yeah. or at the very least you had to take it home and mail it in and put a stamp on it. Uh -huh. Like, I don't like the internet voting for this. I think you should have to commit to something. Like, by all means, make the ballots available at, like, the local shops or whatever, so that even if you're not attending a game, you can pick one up and mail it in. But, like, let's make this a little harder, please. Like, none of this, like, vote 20 times a day on the internet because it's like, well, then who goes to the All-Star game? Well, whoever stands are the least employed. No. Yeah. Like, who has oh, the most don't time? Love that. <laughs> don't love that. Like, yeah. Like, okay, we can figure out who has the most free time by whatever players get in that shouldn't be there. Um, but anyway, so it's straight ticket in the American League for now. Um, in the National League, 
it's chaos, man. I have, I go through, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes I vote for people because I think they're amazing baseball players and I think they deserve to be there. And sometimes I vote them in because I like them. Like, you know, I got Pete Alonzo and Juan Soto on my ballot because I think they're amazing and I think they deserve to be in an all-star game. And, and Mookie Betts and these are guys I want to see because they're good dudes and they're great baseball players. And then I've got Austin Hedges and Ketcher because I love Austin Hedges. And I don't care if he can't hit. And, so well, to your point, that only helps me as an American League person. That's right. The catcher for the other team can't hit it. And I get to see Austin Hedges, who I love dearly. So, heck yeah, man. I voted for him. I voted for Alec Bohm because I love Alec Bohm. He's not good. I voted for Trey Turner. He's not good, at least not this year. I don't care. So, it's just chaos over there, man. The National League, chaos. We're going to have better people at some positions than my American League side. And, like, way worse people at <laughs> other positions. But... I do put a lot of thought into this. It's just not really a thought process that anyone can follow except for maybe the two of you. Like, I think the two of you could have predicted my ballot, but, like, there, there is no, you know, <laughs> there's no real method to it other than, like, being inside Samantha's brain. <laughs> I would also like to add uh, one very important aspect to this. Um, if you were on the roster of the, of, of the scumbag cheaters in 2017, don't bother canvassing my internet connection. I'm not voting for you. Mm. No, no, I don't care. You can be the best baseball player in the history of the world. I'm never voting for you. Yeah. I'll die on that hill with you. Yeah. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right, Derby, anything else you want to add here? I, no, no, I'll just follow up, Smith. I love your story about the uh, also the paper ballot. Um, so I was that kid. I remember being young enough and doing this. Because you remember when you are a girl, they would give you just one. Like, every person got one, and I was young enough and naive enough to think, oh, I could just have one. And I remember during a game, like, somebody would throw theirs down, and I would grab it, and I'd punch it out. And then I would, like, try to go stuff. Like, I'd, I'd hold, like, four or five of them together when i turn them in and make it look like I'm putting one in. Like, look at me. Um, but also fully believing that I just did all the Ranger players four times. So they're definitely going to make the all-star game because I just gave them all three extra votes. <laughs> I mean, but that was what was so great about the paper ballots, right? Is it allowed you to think that way? Like, I remember doing that too. Like, well, if I take one home and nail it, if only my mom would give me a stamp, I could get that second ballot in. And like, if everybody here got a second ballot, we could get all our players on. Like, now there's just some weirdo who just sits in his basement all day with some bot voting from like dummy email addresses. But it, you know, that, to me, that's, like, respectable cheating at All-Star voting. Like, you know, you had to work for that. I respect that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, not Kevin Durant in it. <laughs> oh. FaceTime oh. your horses. Oh, amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, we've, we've come to the part of the program where we have to talk about this. Um, as everyone now knows, because there was a lot of – there was a lot of um, – What's the word I'm looking for here, Samantha? There, there was a lot of um, rounding the bases, uh, almost gleefully writing about Mr. Jagram having to go down with Tommy John surgery. There was way too much of that yesterday. I, I was offended by that. But let's talk about this. Let's talk about Jagram because we all knew the elbow was a problem. Like all of us, every every single one that's followed this game over the last handful of years, all know that Jagram's elbow is a problem. The Rangers medical staff signed off on it. I don't. I don't. I'm not even going to try to decipher any of that noise on them signing off and what they saw and what they missed or what they didn't miss. They probably didn't miss anything. The elbow just finally had its moment. The moment we've all been. It's kind of like watching, waiting for a volcano to erupt. What well, finally erupted? Okay, that's what happened here. Um, but. You flip the script on that, you turn the page, you, and you start talking about this Rangers team that's currently 20 games over 500. they have done that without DeGrom. There's still time before the deadline, if they choose to, to add a starting pitcher to the rotation if they want to go out and get somebody to replace DeGrom. Because I think if you look at the actual impact on the Rangers right now, it's the fact that Dane Dunning is not going to go back to the bullpen. That seems to be the biggest domino that's now not going to fall and reinforce a, a bullpen that has, while lately shown some signs of life, has been the biggest focal point up till, up till now. So I think that's the true impact here. But again, we're right before the deadline, and they've been just fine without him. So I'm, just, I'm curious what your take is here, Samantha, on, on what, 
what is 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 going to be the true impact here of of Degrom going down? All right. Well, I'll start with that part because I think that's the easier part. But I, I want to address his taking of the lap too because I have some things to say about that. But um, as far as how the Rangers kind of fare in this, the Rangers are going to be fine. They're fine. They've been doing it without him for most of this season. They will be okay. Like, would they be better with a healthy Degrom? Of course they would be. Of course. But like, do you really think? The people in the Rangers front office didn't know that this was a possibility. Of course they knew this. And they did the math, and they decided that for their competitive window, that even if this happened, it was worth it, right? Because, like, you guys, he's not dead. He's going to come back from Tommy John. And like right. many other very good pitchers, he will be a good pitcher after Tommy John as well. So okay, it's a bummer, right? Like, yeah, it bums me out, too. Like, mostly because I felt, like, really stinky bad for the guy. He was really upset. I felt terrible for him. Yeah. Like, I feel bad for Rangers fans because it would have been so dope to have Jacob DeGrom in the postseason this year, right? But, like, you know, there are, there are postseasons in the future that will include Jacob DeGrom in a Rangers uniform, and it's going to be okay. And I, I think that one of the most encouraging things that we've seen is that the Rangers, he was, he was the big fish, and yet... The Rangers have been great, and they didn't need Jacob DeGrom to do it. So I I think that's that's wonderful, and I I think it's fine for the Rangers. Is it a bummer? Yes. Is it a catastrophe? Absolutely not. But I want to address this lap-taking business. Now, I think it's fine if you're, let's say, a division rival to be like, yes, the best guy on another team got hurt. I think that's fine. It's not like you're saying, I'm so glad he fell on his head and he's now paralyzed for the rest of his life. You're saying, thank you for taking a piece off the board and making my life easier. So I don't really have a problem with, well, I, we're not including the trash games so this is not a problem with everything. Maybe, but I don't have a problem with Mariners fans or Angels fans being like, yeah, one chess piece off the board. Like, we all do that, right? Like, we're all happy when people get non-life-threatening injuries for teams that are in our way. Like, I think that's okay. What I don't like is the lap taking because of the contract. It just seems petty and small mm-hmm, to me mm-hmm. because it's all coming from teams who were people who wanted to sign DeGrom and failed to do so. And now they're changing their tune. They were real disappointed when they didn't get it, right? Like they were all willing to ignore whatever medical red flags that were out there when he was on the table for their team. Now all of a sudden we're dunking on the Rangers. This is why the Mets didn't want him. I'm like, I don't. Refresh my memory. I don't remember the part where the Mets didn't want him. Do you? Do you? I remember that happening. I don't. Anybody, anybody else remember that happening? Because I'm pretty sure he just chose to go somewhere else. I, I don't remember the part where the Mets didn't want him. That was Carlos Correa, guys. That was the German Shepherd angle, not <laughs> the UCL. Um, so, like, I don't know. I just think it's kind of pathetic to celebrate a player getting injured so that you can be right about something that you never actually asserted the correct opinion about you're just bitter because you didn't get to sign him. So now you want to dunk on somebody else and be like, so good. Mm -hmm. I got hurt because we didn't spend the money. Like, no, there there are many, I mean, acceptable reasons to be happy about an injury as long as we're not talking about like brain damage or like permanent life threatening things. Like you're allowed to do that when your rivals get hurt. What you're not allowed to do is capitalize on somebody else's misery so that you can like, take the sting out of the fact that your team failed to sell this guy, basically. And you'd be saying the same thing if he was on your team now. So I, I don't want to hear that. I think it's garbage. Oh, I agree. That was you, you guys caught my mood last night. We were we were texting each other about this. Like I did not I did not pull any punches. Uh Irby, how about you? Where are you at on this? I, I mean, yeah, sure. Disappointed. Yeah, you love having him there. And I, I spent a good amount of nights this week, the last couple of days, just talking to people about it. And it's one of those that I, okay, so obviously you want him in the lineup and, and a better team when he's in the lineup. But yeah, in, in the competitive window, like you were saying, Sam, in the Rangers' competitive window, there's part of it's like, okay, well, then let it happen now. And you've got him for. <laughs> potentially the the playoff run next year and the years after that you know we'll see i i I, you know a lot of it's going to depend on when they get in there and see how bad it is um but i my biggest one was watching the video uh yesterday of him 
uh, his reaction and, and the emotion that he was showing and all that. I mean, that right there, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I want to be a teammate with somebody like that. I want to be a part of something like that. I want a guy like that. Like, I'll bet on a player like that to rehab and get back on the field. That That's the kind of person you want. That, that's the, as a fan, that's the kind of player you want to cheer for. As a teammate, that's the kind of guy you want to go to battle with. As a front office, that's the kind of person you want to bet on. And so I, I that aspect of it is like, okay, this is great. This is our guy. But, um, <laughs> yeah, this is – it's it sucks what happened. Um, but, you know, I – so you said it multiple times. Like he hadn't pitched since April. The Rangers have been winning since you know when winning without him. So it's not. It, it's a bump in the road, but it's one that they already felt a bump mm-hmm. this season. Um. So where it goes forward, you know, I mean, he's his focus is great. I'm excited to see where he comes from, and it sucks not to have him. But I, you know, professional sports, boy, they're all good. Everybody on those rosters is good. And so it's the next man up. And I know we hear that usually mostly about football. Mm-hmm. That's a term a lot more used in football, but it can be used during baseball as well. And that's what's happened with the Rangers pitching staff of next man up. And Dane Dunning, as you said, has been answering that call. Mm-hmm. He has. I was, I was really looking forward to him going back and to really stabilize that bullpen. But that's okay. This, you know, like I said, the trademark is still there. It's also worth noting, because uh, no one's talking about this, at least not that I've seen. I think this is important. This year's Rangers team has been a shock. None of us, if you, if, you, if you sit here and say that you expected this, you're lying to me, okay? This was supposed to be back to respectability, not the second best record in baseball in early June. That's not where this team was supposed to be. So when you take a look at it in, in that context and where this team really truly is, early, very early in, their, in, in a competitive window, at least that's what it looks like, to me, that they're very early still. If you're going to have an injury like this to a guy like DeGrom, you want it now. Because now, Irby, you mentioned the playoff run, potential playoff run for next year. He's back. He, that means he's anchoring a staff that may or may not have a Jack Leiter in it in 2025, may or may not have a Kumar Rocker somewhere on that roster also in 2025. Guys coming up, we've got Josh Young this year. He's, he's shown... That that next step, Durant's, Durant's taking that next step. Tavares is taking. We talked about Leody last week, I think, taking the next step. Like, this is when you want to have this problem. So all the doom and gloom needs to stop because I'd rather him get this thing fixed to be ready for the meaty part of this window. Samantha, instead of you know not being on the roster, then you know if this is going to happen, this is actually a. In terms of the Rangers window, it's not the worst timing in the world. Yeah, no, that's a really outstanding point because we, all three of us, were higher on the Rangers than most baseball analysts, like by a lot. But we weren't even expecting this, right? I think we said the ceiling was second, and we were a lot more confident that they might finish second than most people. Right. So we didn't expect this. So if there was a good time have a pitcher go down for an extended period of time, it's when you're playing out in front of your window. So, like, yeah, would it have been great if he stayed healthy and they hit the competitive window early? Of course it would. But, like, the team is still built the way that it was built. The fact that they arrived ahead of expectations in terms of how they're performing doesn't necessarily shave a year off the back end. That isn't how that works. Mm -hmm. So okay, like, this wasn't the year to set your sights on the World Series. Like, and by the way, anybody who gets to the playoffs is in the mix for the World Series. Anybody, right? Oh, so, so true. Like, we all know. Except this, the right? Twins. Except, well, except, except, except for the yes, Twins. <laughs> thank you, except for the Twins. Like, okay, anybody except the Twins who gets into the postseason is in the mix for the World Series. And, and that includes the Rangers, and it includes the Rangers without Jacob the Crowd. But nobody's going to be disappointed so if the Rangers don't win a World Series this year. And nobody's going to be disappointed, even if that happens because they were one starter short. You talk to me in the future when this team hits its peak in terms of the competitive window, maybe we'll feel a little differently about that. But that isn't this year, right? So you're absolutely right. If this was going to happen, now is the time. Now is the time. And this team is still going to exceed expectations. They already have. They already and they're going to continue yeah. to do so. Mm-hmm. 
Yep, especially if they, when they fix that bullpen at the trade deadline. All right, Irby, anything else you want to add here before we uh, move on? I No, I mean, just, hey, next man up, keep moving forward. This is, you know, like I said, the guy, this is the kind of guy you want in your locker room. So uh, bring it on. Bring it on. This, it, this, is, this, is the, this is a hit a wall. Whatever. Don't break through. Whatever. <laughs> All right, so – Let's go from the guy you want in the locker room to the entity you want out of baseball. And I'm talking, of course, about Diamond Sports Group, Samantha. Um, recently, you know, baseball took over the Padres broadcast. Now, now fans are basically paying baseball a small fee to stream the games. Um, Diamond has now been ordered to pay, what, four teams? If I remember correctly, it's four teams. Doesn't this really boil down to baseball's archaic blackout rules? Because... For, for example, Irby, you are in Texas. If the Rangers, who are part of this mess, you suddenly lose those rights and baseball doesn't take over the broadcast, you are blacked out just because you live in the state of Texas for watching both the Rangers and the Astros. People in El Paso, Texas, 12 hours away from both cities, are blacked out from all baseball in the state of Texas. I mean, that is just insane. It's stupid. Why hasn't baseball fixed this? We can talk about buying the rights back from, from the regional sports network all we want to, but at the end of the day, Smith, isn't that the real problem? Isn't it the blackouts? Yeah, to me, that's the biggest problem because that is the biggest obstacle to growing your game. So the stuff that's happening with the – RSN is unfortunate, and baseball probably should have seen this coming, but this was a model that worked in the past, and there were some, I think, unintended consequences that came as a result of streaming and as a result of some of these uh, particular RSNs trying to get people to watch through an app and then blacking them out on the TV or blacking them out on the app or what have you. Like, there, there's a lot of stuff here that happened that I think they couldn't necessarily have foreseen way back when these were all the, like, Fox Sports whatevers way back in the day, and it just kind of grew into something that they couldn't control. And they also just happened to get into a situation where a company basically went in and bought a percentage of rights in order to basically bully cable companies. And a lot of this started actually over the tennis channel. It didn't really have anything to do with baseball. They were trying to get cable companies, this was like how it started way back in the beginning, to carry a tennis channel that they owned. And then what they did was hold the baseball stuff hostage and the cable companies didn't fight and then people got blacked out. And then that just kind of snowballed into just this whole series of catastrophes that resulted in people not being able to watch their own team. But the real problem, yes, is the blackout rule. First of all, this whole problem doesn't exist if you lift the blackout rule, because if you are blacked out by whatever RSN is in your area, you could just buy MLB TV. And watch it that way. Yeah. So problem solved. So it would solve that problem. Um, it would also solve the problem for a number of other things. Um, for one thing, I think that if you were going to sell a streaming service that will allow you to watch every game that your team plays, then that ought to be an option for the way that you choose to watch it, mm -hmm. right? So, like, if you're a person who's chose to, to cord cut because you live in a world where that, that is a practical solution for a lot of people, I don't see why you should have to pay for it twice. Um, or why you should have to, mm -hmm. I don't know, not be able to watch it. It's like you're going to pay one way or the other, right? Like nobody's trying to scam anybody out of free baseball games. You're paying for the app. You're paying for cable. You should have the option to do both. You should not be blacked out of using MLB TV just because you live in an area where the cable package might carry it or where the, you know, the RSN has an app or what have you. That's ridiculous. Like, also... Stop blacking me out of games shown on another streaming service that I can't see. Like, uh -huh. I've paid yep. you for MLB TV, right? I pay for that, which means I should see 162 Guardians games a year. The only time that it would be reasonable for me not to see them, and this really shouldn't exist either, but, like, I do have cable, so, okay, when they come to town and they play the Yankees, I can watch that on the Yankee channel. Mm -hmm. You know, but like, I think you should lift the blackout anyway, but I have a real problem with this. Well, you're now blacked out of this game because it's on Apple TV or it's on Peacock. Mm -hmm. Like, I've already paid to stream this. I don't see why I should have to pay twice. 
So especially for something like that that's showing, you know, the Apple TV and the Peacock are the ones that really bug me because they're showing one game a week, right? One game a week. The odds that it's going to be your team are beyond bad. Like, I'm not going to buy Peacock just so that I can watch one baseball game a week. That is absurd. Mm -hmm. So they need to stop doing that and lift the blackouts. Like, to me, everything should be available on an OPT TV. Every single game, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where else it's showing. If you don't have an OPT TV, then yes, you can pick and choose other streaming services, go to your cable company, whatever. But if you're going to buy the every baseball game package, then you should see Every baseball game, no exception. Imagine that, yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that feels like very easy logic. Well, it's counterproductive. <laughs> like, you, you want more people to watch baseball, especially stuff that's out of market, then quit making it hard for them. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. All right, Irby, how about you? Where are you landing on this? <laughs> well, I used the word easy logic, so there's your first mistake. Hang on. Yeah, that's there's fair. That's right. fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, as, as the next, I guess it's the next head to be chopped on this chopping block with the Rangers, the, you know, we're next. The Padres just went through it now. Rangers are next, and like you said, the bill that's out there, that's, I love that. I, 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 that's what always cracks me about. They've been ordered to pay that. Well, if they if they had the money to pay it, they would have already paid it, so. <laughs> Like, yeah. uh, okay, guys, we're ordering you to do it. Oh, well, in that case, we'll do it. Like, no. Um, yeah, the blackout. And the, it, it, Valley, it, it, this thing cracks me up of the, you look at what they were trying to do or what they think they're doing. It, it's this, they were trying to play this long game of basically allowing you to bet on your TV while watching this stuff. And what they didn't, I, it, it's so weird if, like, you can be so wise about seeing that aspect of, like, yes, people from their home with their remote can bet on games, and this is awesome. Oh, wait, people are cutting the cable? Yes, people are cutting the cable! <laughs> like, come on, guys! <laughs> Big issue there, so whatever. I, yeah, uh, I just, I, I, it's painful, you know, this, we talked about the wonderful things when we were kids, where it was as simple as just punching the chat out, and there's my all-star vote. I, it's as simple as, I believe that I want I will pay this amount of money to watch all the baseball games. You are telling me it's this dollar figure. I agree to this dollar figure. So I would like to watch all the baseball games for this dollar figure. Here is the money. Now let me watch the games. Should be that simple. <laughs> yeah, it should. All right, Samantha, anything else on this one? I, no, I just want to, again, agree with what I would be saying. Like, I don't want to do a treasure hunt to figure out how to watch baseball. <laughs> like, I will give you money, and you will give me baseball games. That's easy. it. That's it. Imagine that. Nice and easy. Mm -hmm. It's called easy logic. Just let We will do a treasure hunt for something else. I'm on board with that, but not for baseball. Fair. <laughs> fair. Yeah, yes. that, that's fair. That is fair. <laughs> Uh, okay, one more before we get into armchair umpire. This is a little bit more fun, though, kind of. Uh, I think we can have fun with it. Um, and it's up to you on how specific you want to be. You want to give me a section number in a row because you had a really bad experience? I'm here for that. I'm here for that. Uh, worst seats at a ball game. I'm curious what you guys think this is. Now, of course, obviously, like, you know, the obstructed views. That, that's always going to be up there. But I'm talking about, like, you know, just every stadium, the ones that every stadium has. Like, every stadium has this particular type of seat. And you just have an awful time, or you would have an awful time. It would never sit there. Unless it was Game 7 of the World Series, and it was the only seat available. You know what I mean? Where would, where would you not sit, Samantha? Let's, 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 maybe let's, let me phrase it that way. Where would you not sit at a ball game? Okay, well, I'll give you a specific one and a general one. The specific one, fortunately, does not exist anymore, but RIP to the auxiliary bleachers um, at Progressive Field. They were like temporary bleachers that were set up out in center field. And they were so, these things were so wobbly that they would shake, like, every time everybody <laughs> stood up. It was just like these makeshift things. And we would sit in them anyway because it was so freaking hard to get an Indians ticket back then. 
that it was like, I, whatever, man. Like, the number of games that I went to knowing I didn't even have a seat, like, standing room, like, those auxiliary places were horrible. Like, we never, if we had tickets there, we would just stand the whole time. Like, it was lovely to stand on the home run portion. So those things were awful. Goodbye. I did not miss that. But um, in a more general sense, I think that my problem is either with, I don't like to be in, like, the, like, worst economy of the ballpark and i don't like to be in the best economy of the ballpark for various reasons oh that's right. um yeah. i don't like the like nosebleed seven dollar seats at the top because like everybody up there's drunk you can't see anything so people are fighting because they have nothing else to do and they're drunk like it's just a bunch of people who paid seven dollars to get into a baseball game so that they could fist fight somebody up there because they spent all their money on beer and they didn't have any left to buy a nice ticket so, like, I really hate it up there. And you can't see anything. It's miserable. It's horrible. It gives me kind of vertigo to sit up that high. So I hate that. But I also hate the ones at the other end of the spectrum. Like, I do not like the club seats at all because it is full of people who are there, again, not to watch baseball. I see dudes reading the newspaper. They're trading stocks on their phones. They're piling up a plate from those, like, better quality buffets with crab legs. And then they yell at you to sit down. While you're watching a baseball game in a ballpark because they can't see while they're looking at their phone and their newspaper and their pile of crab legs and they don't want to stand up because they're not real baseball fans. Crab like, legs. I, so, like, I don't want to – they really did have crab legs on the club level. Wow. Uh, at Progressive <laughs> Fields. Um, they really truly did. Um, okay. It was – like, but yeah, I just like, I don't want to be with the people who are too poor to be there. I don't want to be with people who are too rich to be there. Like, it's just like, there are these just ends of the spectrum where it's like nothing but trouble in terms of the way that it goes. And it's not really about baseball. So I'd like to stay away from both of those things. And to be those are the worst seats in the house, because I don't want to be surrounded by people who are not focused on the game. You know, that, that's, that, that's a nice little range, right? Like, like you're basically saying stay away from two areas. If the price of your ticket is less than one beer, stay away. Yes. Yes. If, if, you, have to tra- if, if you have to transfer money out of, your, out of your investment account to buy one ticket, stay away from that one, too. I like that. That's good. It's a nice little range. Irby? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you don't want to be at the ends. Like the extreme ends of ticket pricing are bad. They really they are. are. Bad. They really stay are. away. <laughs> this is why I like. This is why I like you know that nice little medium. It's about 40, 45 bucks a ticket, but you're either right down the lines or you're right there in the outfield, like first row. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's, that's, that's just where I'm at. <laughs> Irby, how about you? Where where are you not sitting? I Samantha, you got a T-shirt idea, by the way. Like that feels like a baseballism T-shirt right there. What the coach said. <laughs> I need that. Um, where where am I not sitting? And I, I I yeah, I'm with you on the uh, you pay less than the price of a beer. Stick over to stay away, stay away, stay far away. Um, I'm also the uh, so I don't love the like lower level back rows. Where you've got like the the second level overhang, oh yeah, and you can't see Agreed. anything. Yeah, that's like totally more than agree. a bunt pop up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's I've had that seat before, and it is an interesting moment. As soon as the balls hit up, you immediately like every single time my eyes would go up, and then I would be looking at concrete, and it's like, oh yeah, look at the fielder. Uh, looks like he's gonna get it, like based upon his. What his running and his movement, I think he's got this one, but I don't know. We'll find out in the next two to five seconds. So, yeah, not not fan of those seats. <laughs> when you're relying on the, when you're relying on the, the fan reaction to tell you what happened, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's that's never gonna do. I was like, I don't, what am I? I really have no idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, well, that's, 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 well. First of all, I agree with both of you. Uh, those those are both awful, awful scenarios. Uh, I've got one more. Um, I've always been one where, like, you know, the the, the you know the, the video board, which you know when we were kids was barely a, a couple of lights that told me how, told you how many balls and strikes there were. Now they're a little bit more elaborate, right? But like, I like to see the the, the if not the if, if not the main video board, I at least like to see a video board. And I bring this up because like you know the Rangers. Last ballpark, which is Irby, that's perfectly stated. Last ballpark, for the longest time, if you were in the home run ports, you couldn't see the video board. 
and they didn't have the auxiliary board on the on the other side of the field at, at that time. So like you were just kind of SOL if you wanted to just hang out and, and look at the video board a little bit because I was like again as part of my ambiance that I enjoyed a ball game. So it's not a problem really with these new stadiums. These new stadiums just have video boards everywhere, but the older stadiums. It could be a problem. So I don't like sitting where I can't see that. I don't like sitting where I can't see the big video boards. I can, you know, in between innings, I can watch the dot race. Uh, I can, you know, keep up with, 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 with other games, out-of-town scoreboards, all that fun stuff. I like to be able to see the video board. And if I can't, I'm not going to be happy. No, that's a good one, too, because that's one of those things that I don't ever think about. Like, I never think about that when I'm going to a game. Like, will I be able to see the video board? But I just realized that if I couldn't see it, I would be mad. So, like, yeah. that's a great point, especially as you said in the older ballparks. Like, I know we used to, like, part of the reason why, there were a lot of reasons why we picked where we did when we decided to, to go in on season tickets way back when at, at then Jacobs Field. But one of the reasons we chose the ones we did is because there used to be only one place where they would show you the radar gun mm -hmm. for the pitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you could only see it if you were sitting out in the outfield because it was on a board behind third base. So that was the only place you could see the radar gun. And it bugged us that we couldn't see it anywhere else. Now I think these things are everywhere and it's a little bit different. But, yeah, I agree with you. Like, it's, I, I would never have occurred to me, but I just realized the reason why I don't like the bleachers at Progressive Field is because you were underneath the video board. Don't like it. Yeah, and if you follow the latest rendering of the A's stadium, like the roof, like they're going to have a roof on it, and the whole roof is going to be the video board. So everyone's covered. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's not on the rendering. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the feral cats, like I was picturing like a planetarium so the feral cats could lay on their backs in the field um, in the middle of the night and watch like a light show on the planetarium ceiling of the dome for the stadium that's never getting built. Yeah, These are going to play in the Coliseum forever. <laughs> Biodome in the desert. Why not <laughs> oh boy all right Irby, anything else on this one before we move on to armchair umpire no i i you were saying yeah that's the ace thing and i'm thinking which rendering got the two dozen <laughs> that's, that's fair uh <laughs> that's a fair point <laughs> Oh boy! All right. Well, it is now time for armchair umpire there, Irby. So you want to take us take us into the wonderful world of wild baseball rules? All right. Well, yes. So I've got another fun one for you guys. Um, I say that like that. I don't always have a fun one, but this one. So we're gonna we're gonna pick up. Um, uh, you know, now now that things are safe, uh, Samantha, for instance, we're gonna pick up on Boston and Cleveland. Let's let's hypothetically say those two are playing, even though they are right now. Um, just, but uh, Boston and Cleveland, <laughs> yeah, how hypothetical is it? Did, maybe this happened while we were on the air, and I'm just pulling it up for now. No, no. um, so let's say, you know, Boston's leading Cleveland one nothing in the last of the fourth inning, um, playing at Fenway. Okay, and um, Justin Turner starts the inning off with a uh, single right up the middle, and then uh, Rafael Devers comes up next, um, and while he's up to bat, um, in the strangest of things that will catch everybody off guard, um, <laughs> Boston puts the hit and run on. That's right. They put the hit and run on with Justin Turner. Uh, it, he didn't do the running, not the hitting. Mm. But he uh, he breaks for second. So Turner breaks for second. Uh, Cleveland's catcher, Mike Zanino, who Samantha, we already heard today, is voting for in the All-Star game. So like a good All-Star catcher, uh, <laughs> he's ready to go. And he gets anxious, a little too anxious, as he pops up to grab that baseball to throw out Justin Turner, who he is not surprised to steal him. And they're taking for second in this hit and run. So Turner's gone for second, but as he's doing that, he accidentally tips Rafael Devers' bat. Rafael Devers, um, so in this situation, missed the sign, and he's trying to lay down a bunt. So he's got his bunt there. Bat, glove comes up. He makes contact with that bat as Devers is trying to put this ball into play. Okay? Sorry, not a bunt. I, I, I read the wrong thing. Not a bunt. Full swing. Full swing, makes contact, but the catcher, Zunino, makes contact with the bat as it is hitting the ball. Okay? Ball goes in with no play at second. 
Cleveland's pitcher. We'll do Class A on this situation here. Say so it's near the end. Uh, he picks the ball up and throws the first. A little too animated. He throws too high for Mr. Naylor there. And it goes right off his glove into right field. Turner continues past second on to third and tries to score. But right field, uh, Mr. Brennan for the, uh, for, the, for the Guardians here, great throw to the plate, and he throws Turner out at home. Okay? Boston's manager immediately screaming and yelling that, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. This should have been a dead ball from the beginning. Catcher interference. Put Turner at second. Put Devers at first. Is that correct? I'm still trying to figure out how you can overthrow Naylor. <laughs> That's a hell of a wild oh, throw. Trust me, it <laughs> happens. <laughs> That's a hell of a wild throw, man. <laughs> Nail- Naylor, you know, he's not for a first baseman though. He's short. I mean, he does amazing splits for, like, a, a tubby fellow, but he's only, like, 5'10". Oh, <laughs> see, I thought he was taller. Okay, all right, carrying on. All right, so, obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, uh, Samantha. Yeah, this is... Okay. The I, catcher makes contact as the hitter is hitting the ball. I don't think that matters, although Irby's saying that that specifically that way kind of makes me think it, may, it actually may matter. But, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's it's catcher making contact with the bat during the swing, right? Which would be catcher interference, right? Devers at first, Turner at second. But well, what was the count? Oh yeah, good point. What's the count on um? What's the count on Devers? Uh, the count is irrelevant, actually, uh, with this ruling. Interesting. Okay. Okay. The count is irrelevant. So, Good question. Okay, Good question. I saw, I see where you're going, but you're, it is irrelevant. All right. So let's try to clear up the easiest part of this first. So in a situation where there's catcher's interference, are we certain that the batter takes first base? I'm not certain of that. I am certain the ball's dead, so Turner doesn't score. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so because to me, yeah, I mean, I think the big question here is: Is this a live ball or not? not. Right. Um, yes. Which uh, I don't know. This is tough. I'm not sure. I, I feel like I'm going to ultimately guess in here, like which is why I was kind of trying to sort out the other part of it because I was like, okay, on catcher's interference, is that a walk? Like, is is, is that a walk? Like, do you take first base if there's catcher's interference? Like, I'm just trying to clear up that part of it. I want, well, could it be because the ball was put in play, right? Like, like if it's... So was the ball put in play? It was, yeah, because uh, Class A overthrew Naylor. Oh, okay, so he did... Okay, so the batter made contact with the ball. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay. Yes, so then, yes, yeah. Okay, so then to me, all right, then that takes that off the table. So basically, so the batter gets first base there. Well, the batter's not first no matter what, because he overthrew it, so it doesn't matter, right? right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so De- Devers is at first regardless. Okay, yeah. so we can kind of throw out that piece of it. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so I think... I think, I'm not positive about this, but I think that because it's the fielding team that caused the problem, wouldn't you, wouldn't the runner be allowed to go as far as he could go? Because shouldn't it be up to you to determine the more, like, favorable outcome for yourself? So, because if they screw up, right, like, if they screw up and interfere, and you can get more out of it than you would have gotten out of it just based on the, like, dead ball, everybody moves up a base, shouldn't you be allowed to do that? Because they compromise the play, not you. I don't think that's a dead ball. I think it plays out. Interesting. See, I would think... Because you screwed up, so... 
Yeah, but see, it, it's catcher's interference. Like it's not like a it's not like fielder's interference. It's catcher's interference. But why would that be different? I don't know. My mind says it's different, but I can't figure out why. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I've been there. Been there. Uh. <laughs> I mean, it, it just seems like something that would be a dead ball. But I'm not totally sure. You've got me second guessing that now. So I'm thinking, Samantha, what we should do here is roll the dice and, and, and go with your guess. I think that's right. Like, I'm pretty sure on an interference call defensively under the circumstances, you would be allowed to go because, I mean, theoretically, you're probably not getting anything out of it by allowing the play to continue Mm -hmm. because I would think most of the time you're not going to have that overthrow at first where the runner advances. But I don't know why you would penalize the hitting team when the whole thing was set off by a mistake on the part of the fielding team. So I'm thinking that the play progresses and the runner is allowed to score. No, the runner's, the runner's thrown out at the plate. Oh, yeah, the runner was thrown out. Oh, right. Brennan, okay. Brennan, so, Brennan throws him out at the plate. Okay, so then he's out. He's out, like, because... Yeah, so... If we're saying yeah, he's out at the play because the play would be allowed to unfold, and if you have then run into a tag later on the play, then well, that's on you. Yeah. It, it, well, if we're calling so, if we're calling it a live ball, then that's exactly the ruling. Yeah, like I think it's a live ball. So okay, so if he was thrown out at the plate, then he is out. Okay, let's roll with it. How do we do there, Irby? All right, so y'all are going with you. You are disagreeing. Boston's manager is running, and he's screaming, yelling, saying, "Catcher's interference, dead ball, runner, my runners at second and first. You yes. guys are saying no. You're saying the play plays out. Yes. Okay. I. This is the first time I'm gonna use it, Samantha. Take your jar of dirt. Ooh. Oh, well yay. done. So okay. good. Well, Two point zero zero catcher's interference, absolutely a thing, and and that is what Boston would be citing here is that catchers on a interference, the ball is dead. On catcher's interference, the ball is dead. However, before that plays out, and this goes to Rule six point zero eight C, which provides that when a batter after interference with the kit by the catcher, catcher interference, the batter reaches first on a fair hit or an error. The play proceeds without reference to the interference. Wow. So, had, last day in that situation, had he thrown the ball to first and Naylor catches it, it's going to be catcher's interference. Had he thrown the ball to second and got to turn on the force out, it's catcher's interference. And the runners went at first and second. But exactly what you said, because of rule 6.08C, on a situation when a ball is put into play off a catcher's interference, the umpires should... <laughs> the umpires should let the play unfold for a force out. Then you would enforce the catcher's interference. In this situation, it did not happen. So, Boston could have left. Turner could have just run to third and stopped there. Devers could have stayed at first. And boom, you got an extra base out of it. But they got greedy, sent the runner home. No catcher's interference. Turner is out at the plate. And Devers could, Devers could move on to second as well. He did not necessarily have to stay at first. He could move on to second. He could proceed forward. It is a live ball. Because once the force out opportunity has passed, because of that error, the opportunity is passed. Catcher's interference is no longer in play, and this is a live baseball. Wow. Phew. All right. <laughs> we did it. You did it. I would say a dead ball. <laughs> That's why you got the jar of dirt. <laughs> That's true. See, we've gotten 
sometimes we're just both wrong, but we're convinced we're right. But I think we've done a relatively good job of like when there is a discrepancy, choosing to listen to the correct person, <laughs> because most of the ones we've gotten wrong, we were we were just both convinced of something that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So at least we both figured out when we should just listen to the other person. It's, it's where we're both convinced of something that is not right that we run into problems. <laughs> Probably because we just continued to talk each other into something that was never correct in the first place. <laughs> so, all right. All right, then. Live to, live to fight another week. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Nice work on that one, Irby. That was good. That was, that was a good one. That was, yeah. That made that was me... great. I may have to take some Advil. That. Hey, that's right. That's right. And the sad thing about that is that would be the hardest thing is to the the, the umpire. And this is where I, I will give respect for an umpire who knows this rule is that you have to let the play play out because the ball is put in play. Many times we don't see that with catcher's interference. Contact is made. The ball is in the catcher's mitt or it's hit foul. You know, there's nothing. So it's immediately catcher's interference. No big deal. But in this situation, um, and, and I think I've, we've seen it before, too, where there has been a tip of the glove with the ball, a deep fly ball, and you see the batter like, hey, 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 hey. But the umpire's not doing anything because you're letting the play play out, um, which is interesting because a runner in that situation should know, okay, you're going to give it to me? Cool. I'm going to start running bases. <laughs> yeah. And if he drops that, I can get the second out of this. <laughs> Oh, boy. All right. Well, <clears throat> that's going to do it for us. We're out of here. Don't forget to, uh, you know, give us a like on the old podcast there. Help us out without alg- without with the algorithm. I'm going to get this out. Give us a like, review, subscribe, hit us up on Twitter. Uh, we have a new Twitter handle for the show. It's at lollygaggingpod. So you'll see us, you know, interacting with that account until we get some more followers to that thing. But keep an eye out for that. Uh, But until next week, watch some baseball. It's good for you.